question was was more kind of a mysticism than a, a structured kind of magical practice. Oh no, I'd say it was very it was very magical. Yeah. Okay. She brought me up very much in um, golden dawn techniques and that kind of thing. Okay, so she was familiar with that and had yeah. had done those kind of practices. Correct. Yeah. Moving away from those more established practices of, of kind of the Golden Dawn and moving into your own system, what what was the motivation or, or what caused you to start going in your own particular path? Well, I think it was just a natural a natural flow. I think, you know, there are, there are plenty of systems out there, whether it's the, the Golden Dawn, the Aurum Solis, and my, my belief is that they all bring you to pretty much the same place that they're there to, in, you know, to in, encourage their members or participants or however they want to look at it, and that then you go out and, and basically create your own system or universe. You know, I'm sure there's, there's folks that uh, perhaps feel that you know, things should be rigid and just kept that way, but to me, magic has always been a lot more uh, closer to shamanism. I don't really think it has anything to do with religion at all. So you, you make a dis, uh, difference between kind of a, a, a religious faith or belief system and then a, a, a more pragmatic or more yeah, scientific? I mean, me, I mean, the magician is God, uh -huh. uh, in that the magician determines how he or she will perceive their universe. Therefore, they're creating or uh, choosing how they perceive their reality. But you just said creation, so I guess you still have kind of an assumption that the magician is a, a creator being, I guess, kind of like God, then. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there really isn't then any need to, to bow down to any other form of deity, is there? All right. Now, that isn't to say that, you know, the magician wouldn't say that there are, you know, energies, uh, or however we want to look at these, that we that you know that we can be empowered by, you know. I mean, if we look at the Kabbalah, I mean that's a you know an interesting um, model for where we can look at these diverse energies, learn to recognize them, so that you know when we need them, we know how to get them. So it's pretty much like say having a toolbox. You need a hammer, right? Mm -hmm. You just go to the toolbox and get the hammer. Okay, so you you kind of see a lot of this as more. Um, tools to kind of get you to uh, a, a particular conscious level or a particular state of being, or yeah, how would I you? Mean, I don't. Um, I mean, to me, it's it's about being alive. Okay. And you know, we can be uh, perhaps preoccupied with all kinds of things, but I mean, to me, magic has always been more that it brings us more into life rather than removing us from it. So it's kind so of it a world of life to be more adventurous. Okay. You know, if we are looking at a system, um, how creative are its members? If its members are creative, it's probably a pretty valid system, right? Right, and now when you're saying creative, uh, creative in what way? Well, I mean, it could be in accounting or it could be painting, it could be writing, you know, whatever, you know, avenue that you feel drawn to, you know? Right. So you, you it, within your conception of magic and, and how you've been working, even somebody who's, you know, excelling at, uh, you just said accounting or maybe even chemistry or, or oh, sure, yeah. um, you know, bioengineering, that could be a form of, of magical creation. Exactly. Okay. Well, uh, I guess in your uh, particular uh, avenues of creation, um, you've created a number of books uh, also some paintings and some audio recordings. And one of the things that you, you mentioned earlier that I thought was, is really fascinating is, whereas like a lot of the Golden Dawn um, books and, and so forth are very structured rituals, do this, do this, do this, or um, non, uh, non-fiction kind of essays uh, explaining things, you take a more kind of parable or, or narrative approach. Can you expand on, on that? in your magical practice and, and yeah, how well, that I feel, out. I feel, you know, a lot of folks talk about, uh, you know, magic being the union of, um, you know, of like science and art, don't they? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the scientific part is the memorization, which I think is crucial, of these um, different workings, rituals, or machines, as I like to call them, to move away from the religious context. And... Um, 
and then also, um, you know, to have the fire created by either different works of art, stories, and things like this. And so this is where this union comes in. You know, it can get very boring for folks, I feel, to constantly be having to memorize this stuff. And then sometimes it just takes, you know, a story or a short story or a, or a movie or a painting or a piece of music to really inspire people to sort of get them fired up or any of us to just keep, you know, to keep going. So, so you see the short story as a means of, of inspiration or, or oh, I think kind of guided meditation? I think meditation? that all forms of, um, uh, you know, all, all stories can be forms of, rev- of revelation. They don't have to be, you know, traditional so-called religious books like the Bible or the Koran, you know? Okay. But I think you can look at, um, let's say, Hesse's Damien or Fowles the Magus and say that, you know, these are forms or, uh, you know, texts of revelation, you know? Okay. So in, in your particular case, you you use uh, short stories uh, frequently. Now, also in well, your... Bo- it, it, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'd say that... I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, please, go ahead. Um, I'd say it's, it, it has a lot to do with setting the mood. You know, so we perhaps have our workspace and we have our candles and incense and things like this. And, you know, the the, um, the, sh- the short story, which I'm, I feel that perhaps um, a lot of folks have sort of taken and used as like, uh, say, guided meditations for path workings and things like this, you know. Mm-hmm. They all go towards sort of setting the mood and inspiring, you know. Okay. Now, in your book, uh, Lucifer Diaries, you used a different format for a portion of the book, and you've actually done excerpts from your personal diaries? Correct, yeah. Okay, and a lot of this is, is during some workings that you were doing um, with particular uh, deities, I guess working with uh, various aspects of Enochian? Yeah, I do that. I mean, I don't know what these, <laughs> I don't know what these entities or energies are, but I find that they are inspiring life enriching you know and encourage creativity what they are I don't you know I don't really know but you know to me it's sort of like a um, a car engine right you can still in- enjoy the car without necessarily understanding the physics of an internal combustion engine you know right okay um, but also I notice in in your in your books especially in uh, Lucifer Diaries there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, Kabbalah that you include in this. Well, I use that as a framework because I think, um, you know, the Kabbalah is a great model for, for sort of referencing perhaps where we are. You know, we'd say that we're, in the, we're composed of the Tree of Life, so we're, we're in all of it simultaneously, but we do have focuses at times. And, you know, for trying to, to try and confirm astral experiences I think it's a great tool so if we're say doing a work in of Venus and then uh, you know after the experience we check all the correspondences and we find that everything seems to be concerned with let's say Saturn and then we know that we've done something wrong in the working okay. so then hopefully we can look at that go back into how we've done it and correct it so again you kind of see the Kabbalah as a, an objective kind of tool to to compare the work to, but it, it isn't necessarily kind of a um, a mystical system in itself. Or uh... no, I don't think so. I don't, to me, it's, as I say, it's it's just one model out of many, and um, you know, it, it's there more as a reference system. It's just that I f- feel that magic is, you know, it just seems that there are so many books out there and so many people giving their opinion on it and trying to sort of uh, let you know how much they think they know, rather than, you know, encouraging people to sort of perhaps find their own way and to get more involved in life and, and to make life more adventurous. You know, I don't think that it's performing the magical te- techniques that are important. It's, it's, it's the results that come from it, you know. Okay. Now, you said you also have done some paintings, Yes, yeah. Um, well, how does painting and uh, work into your system? And in particular, what uh, kind of painting projects have you engaged in? 
Well, I'm presently working on um, a major Arcana Tarot deck. Okay. And uh, I do have some of those uh, images uh, up in a portfolio on um, absolutearts.com. Okay, well, we'll have a link to that then. Okay, and then, uh, but to me, it's almost sort of like an exorcism. That, you know, that you're, you're, you're externalizing um, different experiences or irritations and things like that. So it's a, bit, a little bit like being, you know, an oyster where you're sort of irritated by a grain of sand. And hopefully at the end of the day, you're going to create a pearl, you know. Where did you learn your techniques from? Are you self-taught or did you... Uh... Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, um, um, you know, it's a bit, to, it's, to me, it's always a little bit like looking at clouds. You know, what do you see in the clouds? You know, so that, that's how I tend to look at it, you know. Okay. And I generally feel that, boy, I mean, you just keep putting enough paint on and something's going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Whether or not people want to look at it is a... Well, but yeah, and, uh, and then, of course, you know, who's to, who's to say what... Uh, you know, what's right and wrong or good and bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think it's more that, you know, rather than us being preoccupied if somebody wants, whether they want to read our books or or what number it gets up to on the bestseller list or, uh, or you know, how many people sort of like your artwork, that's not really important, is it? I, I don't think, you know. Right, right. One of the things that it, your, your your book Howling at the Sky and The Sun at Midnight and Lucifer Diaries they seem to have um, a, a very kind of similar you I, I, I'm sure some people have called it Luciferian aspect to it and then the uh, the Black Book of the Jackal is a a distinctly Egyptian book. How do you, but uh, Egyptian book with, with uh, Kabbalistic references in it, how do you well, kind of uh, reconcile all of this together? Uh, well, or, or what do you call your system, first of all, and, and how do you reconcile it all? Well, I suppose Lucifer, you know, for want of a better word, I suppose it's as good as any other. And it's, you know, if you think of that, I mean, it's about the sort of rebellious type of spirit, isn't it? Okay. But, you know, if you were saying that, you're going to be Luciferian, then you would you wouldn't necessarily have you know a set uh, set rituals that everybody did because the idea would be to encourage individuality, and so everybody would be agreeing that they were all different. I suppose it's a bit like uh, um, chaos magic, isn't it? You know, I mean, how, does it really make sense to have organised groups in chaos magic? Um, yeah, that, that that seems to be kind of uh, at the an antithesis of, of what chaos, ma chaos magic right. is about. And so I'd say with this that you know that you can have in you know individual thinkers um, coming together and and agreeing to differ, and, and hopefully you'd all be bouncing ideas off each other and sort of enriching your own sort of universes, you know. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, for want of a better word, like Luciferians probably as as good as anything else, yeah. And of course, it always, you know, to those of us perhaps who feel a little on the outside of things, it's always sort of in, encouraging and um, exhilarating to sort of have that sort of rebel connotation, isn't it? You know, <laughs> right? A bit, like, <laughs> a bit right. like early rock and roll and stuff like that, you know? Right. Well, where do you see your your magical system evolving into uh you know do you see there's if there's any kind of trajectory where this is going no not at all I, it's not something that i've really concerned myself with you know as it's, i say it's it's a little to me it's a little bit like breathing you know it's uh it's a, it's a way of life and it's it's something i do and i tend to find it uh very rewarding. I, I find it sort of stimulates creativity and it, it sort of makes life a lot, you know, more interesting. So I'm not necessarily, I can't say it's anything that sort of crosses my mind about where it might be going. I don't necessarily think that's important, you know. Well, what have been the, the uh, influences on your magical practice? Um, being alive, probably. I mean, I've... I've always found life very exciting. You know, I know a lot of people are preoccupied about where they've been and where they might be going. Um, 
you know, or whether they're being abducted by aliens or they're from Atlantis, you know, 